So when we talk about property, we're really talking about part of your actual identity. And that's the definition that John Locke, the philosopher whose ideas precipitated the founding of this country, supplied when he was talking about property. And it's very much true that when our country was founded, we could choose between either a Lockean set of principles or an Aristotelian set of principles. That's the Aristotle philosophy versus the Locke philosophy. The Locke philosophy is that the individual comes first, that there were individuals before there were governments, and that we all form governments to protect our rights, to secure our rights. And that's evident in, in the Declaration of Independence itself, which states that uh, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, as Madison Seth called it, and as Locke called it, life, liberty, and property are inalienable rights. Rights that, that can't be sacrificed, and that government is instituted for the security of these rights, not for the public good as defined by Cordroy. Uh, you know, and so that nobody could forget this, we wrote down a constitution. We put this promise that government made to us to protect and secure our rights into writing in the federal constitution, in the state constitution, and even in the Northwest Ordinance. Many of your deeds were formed around the late 1700s, the same time that the Northwest Ordinance was instituted, which states that property cannot be taken except in time of immense public exigency, and that's a quote from the Northwest Ordinance, and even then, full compensation must be made. And that's interesting to note because it relates directly to the time period where, where many of your deeds that you hold today were fashioned and where the state border was fashioned. Uh, the, the same is true of the federal constitution, which of course has the Fifth Amendment. It states that there should be no taking of private property without compensation, and it can't be taken unless it's for public use. Well, what was meant by public use at the time was used by everybody, you know, an interstate highway that everybody would use, uh, a, a, you know, a train route that everybody would use for commerce. What it doesn't mean is uh, you know, a spot on the beach for uh, a, a few hippies and bird watchers to peer through your window, maybe fire off a few rounds, or, or whatever else it is they like. In fact, there's already plenty of public use along your shoreline. There are multiple public parks all the way along the Lake Erie shoreline. If they want public use, they have public use already. So this is not an issue of public use. Of course, what we saw over time was that our public use standard eroded and that our property rights protections eroded too at the federal level. And that's for the very reason that we see, again, recapitulated today, which is again, demonstrative of the immense importance of this case to us. Uh, in, in the progressive era, the early 1900s through Woodrow Wilson, and then effectuated more in the New Deal era through Franklin Delano Roosevelt, what we saw was a, a limiting of our property rights, our, our contract rights, and our economic rights, you know, our rights to be free from onerous regulations. Free speech rights stayed the same, but what they did was they segmented and cut those rights in half. They said free speech rights are still hollowed, and we're going to apply strict scrutiny. But with your property rights, we're going to apply a much lower level of scrutiny. And oh yeah, that public use requirement that would have protected you from the audacious claims of the public trust doctrine in this case, that public use requirement, we're going to change it to mean public purpose, which means anything that we deem to be a public purpose is now fair game. So, so in that 30-year period, especially through FDR's switch in time to save nine, where he threatened to uh, basically fire a bunch of the Supreme Court justices or pack the court in the alternative if they didn't do what he said, uh, which resulted in a whole slew of his regulations being uphold, upheld. During that time period, what you, what you really see is an erosion of your property rights at the federal level. Fortunately, however, the good side is that in Ohio, that's not true. Uh, in Ohio, the Ohio Constitution, section 19, article 1, states that private property shall be held inviolate and can only be taken when necessary. And the, the mere text of that language should provide immediate solace to you as after the New Deal era, when it was clear to everybody that the federal courts were not protecting constitutional rights, especially property rights and economic rights, to the extent that the, the Constitution's text actually required, Ohio courts stepped up to the plate. The Ohio Supreme Court stated that if in these times where the federal courts will not protect your individual rights, we'll do it using the Ohio Constitution. The idea is that the federal Constitution provides a baseline level of protection for your rights, but state courts and state constitutions are free to go up and beyond that level and provide
provide greater protections of those rights. And, and that's why we have decisions like we had a few years ago. How many of you are familiar with the Kelo versus New London case? About, everybody about, should be. About half the room. Yeah, everybody should be. It's an incredibly important case, and it's demonstrative of exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, in Kelo versus New London, a woman named Suzette Kelo uh, went all the way up to the Supreme Court because she had a home that she had lived in her entire life that her parents had lived in before that, and they wanted to take it away from her and give it to the Pfizer Corporation uh, to, because, because it would create more tax revenue to do that. And she said, wait a minute, this isn't a public use, and you don't want to pay me for this either. These, these are both problems with the Constitution. And the Supreme Court said, no, public use means public purpose, and this is to increase the tax base. That's a public purpose anymore. So uh, say goodbye to your house. We're going to bulldoze it. The Pfizer Corporation actually never came, and it's still not there today. An economic development plan from the government that you're all too familiar with here in Cleveland. You see it all the time, you know, some grandiose public-private partnership that never comes to fruition. But just one year later, in Ohio, Joe, a guy named Joe Horty uh, had an opposite result. He lived in Norwood, and the city of Norwood, down by Cincinnati, wanted to do the same thing. They said, hey, uh, Horty, we're going to bulldoze your house so we can build one of these fancy new lifestyle centers, like the one down the road, and it's going to increase the tax base, be good for economic development, and the Supreme Court of Ohio said no. While the federal courts may have advocated the federal constitution, in Ohio, the public use clause and the takings clause still mean something. And what they mean is that property can't be taken and given over to a private developer for economic use. And they went further in this decision. They talked about the sacrosanct nature of private property. They deemed private property to be a fundamental right. The reason that's important in your case is that, you know, I talked about that bifurcation of rights, that segmentation of rights at the federal level. Well, that's not true of things that are fundamental rights. When they're fundamental, the court has to really strictly pay attention to any deprivation of those rights. And in Ohio, private property rights are deemed to be fundamental rights under Norwood v. Horney as of 2006. This is very helpful to you. And it's helpful to understand this, that when we talk about private property rights, we're not just talking about your right to own property. Because after all, Private property rights are a bundle of rights, right? If you simply have the right to own property, but you don't have the right to use it, you don't have the right to exclude others from it, well then what does your ownership matter? You don't have the right to sell it, well then what does your ownership matter? It's a bundle of rights. What we're moving towards, unfortunately, and what we'd like to stop through the 1851 Center and through your efforts uh, in this case, is this, this slow drift towards a worldview that private property rights only mean the right of ownership. Um, when in fact, that ownership right is hollow. If you can't use your property as you see fit, if you can't, certainly if you can't exclude people from your backyard where your children want to play, where you want to be left alone to read the paper, or whatever else it is. And, and amongst all else, really, this is about your fundamental right to exclude others from your private property which is the very thing that makes it private instead of public. Uh, it, it's the right to recognize that the state does not hold a first mortgage on your existence or on your property, but you own it, not them, and you don't own it subservient to what they want. An opportunity to, to recognize that this idea of collectivism, that you merely exist and hold your property for some greater good so that somebody else can come in and use it for what they want to use it for is completely the opposite of our founding principles, which are actually more akin to individualism. The idea that the state exists to secure your rights rather than to take them away and give them to others.